and this week we'll be going headfirst into the full review of the novel Light of the Jedi by Charles Soule. It's the first novel in the High Republic era of novels that have just come out. And we've finished the book and we're ready to talk about our complete thoughts moving forward. So who wants to kick us off with that? Well, I just want to say as a whole, this is a very exciting novel, right? I think for myself, it's been a while since we've had like Star Wars novels kind of dictate things that are happening, like new interesting concepts. Like, yeah, we get like small stuff that like kind of fills in character stories or interesting concepts or like moments that explain people's behavior in the films or shows but we've never had like something completely original completely new right this is our this is probably the first setting in star wars that had never been explored and now we're getting like a very specific story out of it that's gonna be galaxy spanning um so as a whole you know i thought the light of the jedi had a pretty tough task Kind of like how Aftermath did um, when the Disney canon restarted. But unlike Aftermath, The Light of the Jedi just hit it on the nail. An ensemble book, an ensemble cast in this book. You know, a lot of awesome depictions and details. Charles Soule brings what he had in his Vader line into his writing. Um, and he sets up, you know, the state of the galaxy and, you know the losses and the gains in the very first b beginnings of the High Republic's fight against the Nile and everyone else. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there talking about uh, the differences between this and Aftermath. Because Aftermath was so exciting for us initially when it came out, and I remember being there as a fan in 2015 ready to consume any new Star Wars content that could possibly get. And Aftermath came out and it was pitched as the book that was going to explain everything that happened post Return of the Jedi. And it was a journey to the Force Awakens. It was going to give us so much content in this 30 year gap. And it followed a group of people that really had no connection to the movies, minus Wedge and Snap. But even Snap was a side character. But moving on, uh, it was disappointing. It was kind of slow. And it doesn't really pay off until you get to the later books. And the thing about Light of the Jedi is it pays off right at, right away. Like I, in previous episodes, we talked about the earlier chapters pretty in depth. But uh, from the beginning, you get to see the Jedi that we were pitched when they announced the High Republic era, the cohesive unit of the Jedi Order that existed at this time, and the Jedi at the height of their powers, like the Knights of the Round Table. Each one can use their powers in their own unique way. Force is so... Charles Soule does such a great job making the Force so unique for each individual, each person feels it in a different way, like Avar Chris with the song, or Elzar Man with Force Like a Sea. Um, it's just, it's so... Well done, and it gets straight to the point, and we're thrown right into the action, and it never stops. This book was so exciting, and I, I don't know if I've read a Star Wars book as quickly as I read this one. It took me a little over a week to finish it, and I'm a slow reader, and this was just so exciting. Characters were so well written, and they each had... He was able to, to make each character distinct despite them, you know, all having the same abilities, right? They all have the ability to use the Force, but, but by giving them different ways in which they view the Force or giving things they're strong at, like some are more telepathically strong, some are stronger with more physical Force abilities, uh, and some are more empaths with, um, with animals and with other people. I think... Light of the Jedi was the, probably the most perfect way we could start the era of the High Republic, and it, it sets up so many great things. Uh, to me, one of the best of which is our new villains, the Nile, or the Nihil, as they're pronounced in the audiobook. So I'm not sure which way we're supposed to say that. But let's it's, talk about it's weird because I think in the High Republic videos on YouTube and all that, they call them the Nile, right? The authors also call them the Nile, so. 
I guess maybe it's just kind of like a tomato tomato thing. Yeah, I I kind of like the way it's pronounced Nihil, just because it seems, I guess, a little bit more Star Warsy Star or Wars-y. like yeah, because <laughs> Ni- yeah, the because Nile is is a word you know that exists in English language and it's kind of like it's been used in Marvel comics and stuff like that and. To me, it just sounds a little bit more unique as the Nye Hill, but I, I yeah, I've only, I've heard it leading up to the book. I had only heard it as the Nile, but let's talk about them because they are very very unique villains, and we've never seen anything like them in canon before. Yeah, I mean, I it's strange because I think it's a book that really captured my imagination but not in the way that I was expecting, right? Like, when I think of, like, old EU novels, like the Jedi Academy series, Thrawn and all that, the way those books were kind of built up was, like, yeah, you get some really interesting new things happening at the beginning, a little bit of a lull, but there is, like, obviously development with the characters and obviously with the original three characters from the original trilogy, and then... Things would escalate more and more, and then it'd be like a very explosive finale. For me, just reading this book, I mean, it's fair to say most of the biggest excitement, uh, like most of the biggest stuff that you could say that affects the galaxy happens in the first part. Um, I know me and Liam have finished reading the books, and Jared has, I think, finished part one or so. But uh, if this is a small spoiler for both Jared and everyone reading, the biggest part of the great disaster isn't really like the ships of the legacy uh, run ship, like breaking apart in pieces and crashing um, throughout the galaxy, but it's actually a canister of Tabana gas that's flying into or floating towards the, one of the Hetzel mo- uh, st- suns. Right. And that could have been an, an event that, could have been very star killered and when i say say that i mean like in the original force unleashed there's a whole scene where like he's pulling down a star destroyer from the ground and like tearing it apart little by little and bringing it up to him and like yeah that's an incredible display of power but for the time period and the era and for the story purposes it doesn't really sit well with the pal, uh, the Emperor, or Vader, Ram Koda, you know, just any of the EU Jedi who were still in exile and all that. So this was a situation that I thought could have easily upended the book because it's it's definitely something that could cause a huge destruction of the solar system, and it reminded me of uh, the Jedi Academy series with the Sun Crusher and Kite Duron firing like these explosives that would cause like a whole chain reaction of the sun. And I was expecting something like that, but the way that, you know, Avar Chris, um, the Jedi who like listens to the force as a song and how she like connected with everyone and like translated it in a way for everyone to understand how to connect with her in this network. And then to use that network to like, just guide things, push them, right. Just enough of like enough power behind it, enough like a willpower behind it. And then the fact that some of them also die in this process, right? Because they're exhausting their force ability. That's what made it epic for me. I was like, okay, like there's real stake. There's real weight and consequence. It's not just like, oh, we have a Death Star 3 now, right? Or there's a Star Killer base or like a Sun Crusher or a World Destroyer where things are just escalating in terms of pure power. That has a place in the story, but especially with this time period, especially with how we see the Jedi as being peaceful, but powerful, you know, have their own will, just the way that they're viewed as like these amazing gods and goddesses, angels, if anything. And then to see them actually like sacrifice so much, get beat up, die, right? Alongside all these other characters that we've been introduced in the first few chapters. I think that really set the tone for the story. I feel like these are elements that like I'd want to see in movies, but I, I I question a lot. Like, why aren't aren't these like stakes so great in the films and everything? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I I haven't heard that part till now. Um, 
so I, I guess I'm I'm a little saddened, but I don't really I'm know. I'm sorry. Who, no, no, I'm it's sorry. not good. Okay, no, no. <laughs> I, I think it was necessary. Uh, but yeah, no, I think like this story, or I, I think the novels in particular, I think they have such the power that they can I, uh, uh, depict these these characters as uh, these indestructible, indestructible like de deities and everything. Um, and and to to basically just um, kill them off as like this the symbol of uh, uh, impurity and and like no one is safe. Um, I think that's a really very strong theme moving forward. Yeah, I think that's a good point, and the stakes of this book are are relevant, really. Well, from from the cataclysmic events that are going to happen that the Jedi prevent uh, with the Great Disaster, which is is really a, a genuinely incredible piece of writing. It's so well written and it's exciting. And even though you you kind of assume as it's happening that the Jedi are going to succeed, because there's still three quarters of the book left, it's still like such a <laughs> a heart pumping moment and. That carries out through the rest of the book, and we we eventually you know lose some of the Jedi that are introduced in that sequence. Uh, maybe not as many of the main characters as we probably will by the end of this whole story, but we do lose a couple uh, that are given significant amount of page time throughout uh, part one of this book. But uh, going back to what Sonic said about the structure of of this book and a lot of the EU books, and even, I would argue, too, a lot of the canon books we've gotten are very dull in the middle, and sometimes they feel long for the sake of being long. They're much shorter stories. That was one of the things I did appreciate about, appreciate about Tarkin, because it's a short story, and it kind of gets straight to the point, though sometimes it does drag when it goes to other characters outside of Tarkin. Um, it doesn't... It, it, Every chapter, and, and most of James Lucino's books do this, every chapter is significantly plot impactful. Um, and, and this whole novel feels like it's, if something doesn't happen specifically in a chapter to someone or to, uh, or to a planet or to a group of people, it feels like it's setting it up for <clears throat> an eventual sequel that will tell that story. And so I, I could say that might be one slight negative with this novel too um as it's trying to set so many things up sometimes they throw out a lot of names like a lot of names and most of them are characters we're not familiar with yet and for the most part you can keep track of all the main characters but there are some that they just mentioned because they're the lead characters of other books like wreath silas or um Anestra Rowe, which is the main character of a test of courage those names are just dropped so they're, it feels like they're all part of the same universe, but but really they don't have any impact on this story. So that was something I, I noticed when reading. Sometimes you can kind of do a double take and go, wait, who is that? And ultimately it doesn't really matter for this book, but still the interconnectivity that they're able to achieve through this book and, and a constant sense of excitement. And to me, honestly, part two might be my favorite part of this book. Uh, it, it's as exciting as part one and part three. And you get way more story and way more backstory on a lot of characters. And going back to the Nile, uh, <laughs> I I love the way the Nile interact with each other and and what they're all about. Uh, the introduction of the rule of three within them, I, I I thought it was going to be when they initially say it something more, and they're obviously leaning into the fact that it's playing off the rule of two with the Sith, but it doesn't have any Sith connections. It's basically the fact that the Nihil. Are divided into three groups. There's the Eye of the Nihil, who is Martian Ro, and he is our, or less, our main villain. Uh, and he is the one who has access to these paths, and they're the hyperspace lanes uh, that are secret that the Nihil can use to travel throughout the galaxy. And Martian Ro, it's one third of the 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 bounty that they collect when they raid uh, somewhere or someone or a ship or something. And then the other third goes to the Tempest Runner, and there's three Tempest Runners. Uh, Pan Ada, 
uh, Lorna D and Kasov, who are, you know, for the most part in charge of the Nye Hill uh, because they command the armies, which are called Tempests, and the rest of the armies get the other third bounty. Uh, and it's such a Mad Maxian, like crazy style of of villain, these marauders. And and I just really wanted to see what they look like in, in live action. I think they would look so cool. On top of that, they're just kind of punk rock. They're very... They're, they're obviously inspired by Mad Max, especially Fury Road. But, but uh, I, I just loved how these guys operate, and they're so ruthless, and there's no mercy, but it's all about themselves, and it's all about taking what you want, and that's the main uh, motto of the Night Hill. It's, it's do, we do it our way, and we get to take whatever we want. We don't really have any villains like that in canon, currently. Most of our villains have either been the Empire or uh, the Separatists, <laughs> and we, we have not expanded to, to villains like this. It's fun to finally get something that's unique and, and something that's so chaotic that the Jedi kind of can't deal with it. Yeah, totally, totally agree with all those points that you've been making making on there but um yeah i guess adding on instead of like the lull that kind of comes with like the middle of any sort of content whether it be a tv show a movie or book or whatnot i think it was a really smart decision that you know really introduced the nile i'm gonna go with nile because I, I like how it sounds but um i really like the inter uh, decision to like finish the first part then hit the interlude introducing martian row and everyone then kind of jumping into their perspective because they're not, they are villains. I mean, they're brutal. They're m mass murderers. They're willing to kill each other. And they could just be like classic marauders in the sense, you know, like pir pirates at the sea and stuff like that. But they have a sort of code, a sort of twisted honor. They have a great structure, as you pointed out, the rule of three. But that rule of three, all of them are kind of tied down to the I, who throughout the book, they think is a lesser position, you know, just the person in charge of the paths, which is how these, uh, uh, what is it, these Nile are able to just suddenly appear um, in different places throughout the galaxy without conventional hyperspace. And uh, there was a, I also really like the sequel trilogy connection. Uh, with the Santecas, I thought the characters, the oldest Santecas that were involved on the uh, throughout the book were very multi-layered. I think that says a lot about how complicated their family is. Um, and it's interesting to see how their what their economic status and their position is like individually. Um, but the, while they might be doing well or being influential in this era, how do they go from that to, you know, kind of being members of the Church of the Force? Like, is it just Lore Santeca in the sequels that becomes part of, like, the Church of the Force? Or is that something that the whole family starts moving into? I don't know. That, that would, it just raised a lot of questions for me. But, yeah, I mean, obviously following the villains a bit more was really nice. Um, as a whole, I mean, I know canon books have been pretty decent about it. And some of the old EU was as well, but... It, it it's really nice to see characters that are like unrepressed. Um, obviously, I I think it goes without saving saying, but Avar and Elzar they got something going on there. I mean, they both like each other way too much to be just <laughs> friends. Um, Elzar is basically our Han Solo at this point, just doing things recklessly. Actually, he's like a Quinlan Voss mixed with like a. Uh, Han Solo. That's how I uh, pictured his actions, and Avar is like, I don't know. She's like, she's like Padme and Leia, and then there's something totally unique out of that too. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, our Jedi have these strong connections, right? They even mention like, you know, we're not supposed to form attachments, but um, on Alfaro, obviously, uh, they have their outpost uh, there, and they find this little hound dog like a flame that like shoots flames out of its body and they call it ember they take care of it and all that and they're like well the force does say we should love every animal and creature so you know just taking care of it was just our duty 
And it's like, that sort of thinking is exactly what I think a much happier Anakin would be saying. And, you know, an Anakin in Attack of the Clones kind of does say, right? A bit too creepily, but, you know, still in the same mindset. So, like, obviously the Jedi are willing to bend the rules. They, I mean, the whole point of this book is to show how much individuality they still maintain within an order. And obviously the Nile are these, these what was the word for it? Uh, something punk, uh, crash punk or whatever that they used to describe like the music that they were playing. And, like, and they, they, they take these like drugs that like hit them super hard and like get them all wild and crazy and stirred up. But then they also have like pills that make them like round off the experience. So it stays even and consistent and keeps on getting better and better. Like, drug use, alcohol parting, like those are things that we've seen in Star Wars, but not to like, never in a, any, in, in anything more than like a simplistic, like, oh, these are bad or oh, these are good. It's like a bit more well-rounded. And to add to that, right, we have our human characters. And I think my favorite human characters were the two uh, fixers on the Starlight Beacon that joined them, Joss, Joss and or or something. I forget. I forget their name. Liam, do you remember? I think it's Joss Adrian, and I forgot yeah. his wife's name. Yeah, but like, there's like, they're like, they're just two random dudes. They're like, oh, like yeah, we're we're here. We'll help out. We're civilians. And then like once they and they keep on helping, but like there's also like a mini moment where like the wife is thinking about like, oh man, we had vacation plans, and she just goes into like such detail about like how much fun she was gonna have. Hint, hint with her husband and i was like wow it's really nice to see people who are uh not repressed throughout the whole galaxy right it's like i know it's a book format and i know dark disciple really gets into uh this sort of same territory but it's it just feels like the whole vibe of the galaxy at this point is like yeah we're expanding we're trying new things we're all the republic right like this is an era to really embrace things and not feel limited and I think that really helped set the tone throughout the second half of the book. And then obviously our final third, we get more into our conventional battles and all that, but we're also split up into multiple parties. And it really felt like, you know, uh, like episode one where, you know, we see Anakin flying with all the Naboo pilots. We see Padme leading all her uh, Naboo guards through the palace uh qui-gon and obi-wan versus darth maul right there's so many different perspectives going on the gungans obviously fighting off the droid army it's like four different battles and like in this book there's like so many different battles going on and i will say it was a little hard to keep up with it at times if i didn't read it slowly but when i did i was like man there's just so much good stuff going on and it's even better knowing that like one of the villains behind all of it is pulling all the strings but like not in like a palpatine like oh i know everything going on but more like i am willing to destroy everything to get everything which i thought was very very cool like martian Ro, he's already climbing up as like one of my favorite villains in all of star wars absolutely agree i i love martian Ro and and a lot of his um his monologues are like the, the times you get inside his head and his interaction with uh, Mari Santeca, who he is the, this old woman who is create, responsible for creating the paths, uh, and nobody else knows that except him and his family. He, she's basically, she's described as being like uh, over 100 years old and kept alive in this medical pod. And basically, she's just a slave to him creating these paths constantly. But she's kind of senile, so she doesn't really know what's happening to her. and he's when she doesn't do what he wants he's like shocks her and he's he's ruthless but it's cool kind of following his journey along with how nihil view him because at the beginning of your introduction to the nihil they don't uh like we said they don't respect him he's kind of just the guy who gives them the ability to do what they do and so they keep him around because they need him, but no one thinks he's worth a damn. Thinks he's useful outside of that. He never goes on any raids. He doesn't do any marauding. He doesn't lead anyone. 
on. And you get to see that transformation of him becoming this ruthless kind of vicious leader that he is by the end of the, the book where he's willing to sacrifice any single person in his way. He, is, he doesn't care whether you're on his team or not. You're an enemy unless you help him make him stronger. And I think he, he's in line with a lot of Star Wars villains we've had, but he does it in so many different ways. He's not as not as manipulated. He's a little bit more direct than someone like Palpatine. Yet he's still has all the the safeguards and the fail safes to make his plan work. He's going to sacrifice you if you try to stop him. And I, I can't wait to see how he interacts with the Jedi. And we do get to see a little bit of interaction with him and Loden Great Storm uh, towards the end of the book when he captures him and takes his lightsaber. And I I really excited to see if he's what he's going to do with a lightsaber. He he does have this other weapon that they they described in the book. Um, they don't say it's like a vibroblade or anything like that. It almost sounded like one of those um, staffs that General Grievous's guards have, but it was they kind of described it as more of a unique type of weapon that he uses as a play, in place of a lightsaber. But it'll be kind of cool if he's going around fighting with type of dual or direct interaction with more Jedi. Um, yeah, I I found him to be honestly one of the most compelling characters. And I think I think that could be a knock on this book a little bit. And for me, it wasn't. I I enjoyed getting our initial introduction to all these characters because I know they'll be fleshed out more in all these other materials we're getting because we're getting books and comics and young reader books and junior novels and young adult books, all this type of stuff. But uh, I could see people being down on the book a little bit for the fact that we don't get any one character outside of Martian Row, in my opinion fully de uh, developed and realized like there's a lot of characters started and their journeys and their arcs are started but they don't wrap up completely like you would in most books so it definitely feels like a piece of the big larger scheme uh then then uh, especially than we're used to in canon because canon the vast majority of our books in canon have been one offs i think we only have this is only our third series or fourth series of books <laughs> In, in all of canon. Everything else has been a, a one-off. So we had Aftermath, we had Alphabet Squadron, we had Thrawn, we had the first Thrawn trilogy, and they're on a second Thrawn trilogy. Uh, but this is easily our first big, large-scale, interconnected uh, novel world. So, yeah, the characters don't get to have full, complete arcs, but for me, that was okay. Uh, we, because we Martian Rowe really does have a <laughs> strong arc in this book and everybody else gets started on what I would assume would be a pretty satisfying journey time we're yeah I, I mean I, I agree with those criticisms and just like you I didn't really have too much of an issue with them more just because it's like one of those books that not only has like an endless amount of possibilities to come out of it but it also has quite a fun story to follow along um yeah i mean i echo everything that you're saying and i will say by the end of the book there are hints of like the prosperity of the high republic that are starting to show cracks like you know admiral cronara he's like he reminds me of like our uh, uh the republic uh commanders on the in the republic navy during the clone wars and admiral piet and all those other people in the imperials he's not necessarily evil but he is very much someone who believes you know peace is achieved through justice uh you know through a show of defense if not some show of force so it's interesting to see a bit more militaristic stuff to come into play and i mean it has to because the nile are crazy barbarians like their ships are unlike anything we've seen in star wars to me when i was imagining them visually they looked even uglier than i thought so i'm, I'm curious to see how they actually look like because it all all i could imagine were like ships with a bunch of spikes around them 
and like <laughs> potatoes with spikes around them. I hope I hope it's a lot more complicated and intricate and gaudier than that. But that's the only visual I was getting, <laughs> and I'm like, that's that's technically a different Star Wars design. I just hope it's a bit more well-rounded, well more dimensional than that. Um, I, I mean. It's hard to say anything against, uh, you know, the decisions made in this book. Like, there's obviously some star Jedi that we're going to follow. That's that's going to be the case. In what format, we don't know quite yet. Um, we know that, like, a Test of Courage, Vernesta Rowe is going to be in Out of the Shadows. Um, a character like Stellan Gios, who we don't hear anything about, but we know he's, like, part of the big three Jedi with um, Avar and Elzar. Uh, he has zero lines, I don't think, in this book. But we know he's going to be pretty big and out of the shadows. Like, it's it's really the initiative taking its first chances and trying to shove in as much as possible without feeling overstuffed. And to achieve that balance, I guess they did have to like name drop people dying, right? People who had a great effect on. Um, a lot of our Jedi, a lot of the other humans and aliens, but it worked well. Like, I mean, I could say I'm like satisfied with like characters like Captain Bright, you know, his sacrifice. I thought that was emotional, well done. It really added to the stakes of the whole great disaster and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, as great of a disaster as it was. There was a lot more that came out of it. The Nile really started pushing themselves against uh, the other worlds. They made a lot of mistakes. A lot of that wasn't intentional. Some of it was just because the Jedi are just that great, that willing to sacrifice everything for the greater good. Um, but there's also like a lot of brutal elements, and it shows that the Nile are are vicious. And you know, right now. They use their own body and were willing to sacrifice their own body of troops and soldiers uh, for their cause. But in the future, we don't know what they're going to do. I feel like they're going to, at least uh, Roe is going to go crazy with all the things he uses. He's a manipulator. I don't think he's not a manipulator, so I have to disagree there. I think he's just someone who's openly vicious and openly manipulative. But the difference between him and someone like Palpatine is that we can see a little bit of his heart and his twisted heart and mind and like some of his more private scenes that he has in the book. So yeah, I don't know. A great book for me. Um, definitely makes me excited to read a Star Wars book because I know that there's stuff like this coming out. Um, I guess Liam, if you want to finish up your thoughts and move on to test of courage, be my guest. Yeah, sure. I would, I, I have a pretty similar point of view with everything that you just said. It's just, it was a great book. I, I think it's easy for me to say it's a top five canon book for me. Um, it was exciting. It, there was constantly new information that was presented that felt always felt important. Uh, characters felt like they weren't stuck. You, you weren't just an added Imperial here or a, a new droid or it, stuff like that that we've gotten through most of our canon books where we get other versions of characters we know in the, the main saga and plus a, a random character from the saga that we don't know that much about but let's explore a little bit more about them this was all new everything was new we got to learn new personalities they weren't completely rip-offs of other people from uh, the saga and i just really really enjoyed it this is the type of book that i actually could see myself rereading maybe a year from now before the next phase of high republic comes out uh i i really really like this book and i can't wait to see what they do moving forward thanks so much for watching this segment of the star wars lads podcast if you enjoyed this content please like the video by clicking the thumbs up button down below and subscribe to our channel for new Star Wars content every single week. If you want to watch our full discussion, click the video on the left. Or if you want to check out one of our other awesome videos, click the video on the right.